So um, our presentation is about United Nations and OpenStreetMap. But first, let me give you a little bit um, background of the United Nations. So you are in the UN building, but maybe you're not all familiar with our work. So uh, the United Nations was founded in 1945 uh, by 51 countries. So the aim was to have international organizations who will be able to bring all together, all nations, to work together towards uh, peace and development. So what we do? Um, we have actually different departments, programs, and agencies uh, who are in charge to tackle different themes and uh, challenges. So um, one of our organizations uh, will be charged to work for peace and security, called the DPKO. Another um, uh, program will be um, you know, towards food, so for example, World Food Programs, Health, Environment, Humanitarian Affairs, which is actually uh, where me, me and Dita works for. Uh, the name is long, it's called United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, but we just call it OCHA. And um, actually the list is very long, we work for um, logistics, refugees, education, so and so forth. So I won't list all of them. So now let's go more closely to the subject, um, the use of maps. So how we are using uh, maps into our work. So for example, um, it was great to have a presentation before uh, from uh, Peace Corps as well as um, American Red Cross, uh, because we do kind of similar work, um, and especially in developing uh, countries. So this is an um, uh, example of uh, fear operations, uh, the way we use maps. Uh, so it is a picture from Sahara. So you have a peacekeepers uh, using maps to orient themselves in the desert. So this is another example. Um, it's a picture from 1979 during Security Council. So Security Council um, is uh, another uh, building where you have a member state uh, who is going to discuss and tackle some uh, um, issues, for example, security. So this is picture showing um, discussion about the security issues in West Bank. And we are producing a lot of maps um, to inform and to advocate. Um, so this is an example of map that has been produced by our field colleague in Central African Republic, showing the current situation about humanitarian access in the countries. So actually the list will be long to say how we are using maps, but today we'd like to really present you about the use of OpenStreetMap um, in our work. So when I heard about the, um, these conferences, uh, I contacted my field colleagues uh, working right now in different uh, countries in uh, providing humanitarian response, asking what type of work you have done in the past uh, or currently working uh, using OpenStreetMap. So I receive uh, feedback from 14 countries, and please, this is not representing at all all the work that are currently done by OpenStreetMap and Humanitarian Affairs um, in the field. It's just uh, those who provide feedback. So we wanted to present to you um, three works, one which is on data preparedness, one on uh, responding to a crisis, and the third one, a global initiative using OpenStreetMap. So the first one is uh, disaster preparedness in Indonesia, um, where Dita has come from. <laughs> and uh, actually, instead of me um, describing the, um, the project, I, we interview actually our field colleagues based in uh, Jakarta to tell us the story about um, OpenStreetMap uh, and United Nations and humanitarian partners in Indonesia. So it will be a short video. My name is Faisal Tamrin. I'm working for the OCHA Indonesia in Jakarta as an information management officer. Uh, Indonesia is a country where small and medium scale disasters are commonplace. Last year we had more than 1,500 small and medium scale disasters. The preparedness, response and recovery phases can happen simultaneously. This is why we work together with the humanitarian open map team in Indonesia to have a better prepare, especially in geospatial data. In 2012, we worked together with national and regional disaster management agencies, AUSAID, uh, World Bank, and University of Indonesia to map Jakarta as a part of the flood preparedness activities. But at the same time, 
the data is being used for a contingency plan. As you can see on my screen, the result of that work is being shared back to the community. Last year, we conducted a missing maps project to join the global initiative where we are focusing on areas surrounding four high alert volcanoes in Indonesia. The result is highly appreciated by the government and used by them for preparedness activities. We still continue working closely now with the HOT in Indonesia and hope to achieve more in the future. Thank you. So uh, this was an example of um, disaster preparedness. Um, and just to give you um, uh, a glimpse of how the data preparedness is important in our work. So data preparedness meaning that we do preparedness we are before the disaster strike. So um, this is an email that I received from uh, John Marinos, uh, who is based in uh, Thailand in the regional office for Asia and Pacific. Um, so when I ask all my colleagues and getting feedback from them what type of work they are doing and what type of wish they have uh, working with OpenStreetMap, so it was on the 1st April 2015. So what he was saying was, um, as far as future project, one that comes to mind is preparedness work in Nepal. So OpenStreetMap uh, is slowly mapping all the buildings' footprints in the Kathmandu Valley. This data would have many possible uses, but we are interested in its use during a Kathmandu earthquake scenario. And he was saying um, the scenario and even that some estimate could claim between 200,000 to 1 million lives. And I'm sure you all know what happened two weeks later on the 25 April 2015, the earthquake strike. So meaning that um, uh, all the project, if we're able to do the Nepal preparedness in advance, maybe since the day one, we'll be able to have all those maps ready in order to respond quicker. So preparedness uh, is very important. So um, next uh, is to show you an example of work that we're doing um, in a current crisis. Um, and I'm sure you all heard about the Ebola crisis that, hap um, that started um, last year. So again. Hi, I'm Luis Hernando Aguilar Ramirez, Information Management Officer in the United Nations Mission for Ebola Emergency Response. I'm now in the Special Court in Freetown, where we are still fighting the battle against the Ebola virus disease that, as you know, is affecting some of the countries in West Africa. United Nations agencies, NGOs, and other international organizations work together with the national authorities and the communities to stop Ebola. Some main challenge in humanitarian response in developing countries are poor internet connectivity, lack of data, and limited tools. But the humanitarian workers are receiving support from citizens worldwide that provide knowledge and social value to this emergency. And I want to say thank you to all the digital humanitarian volunteers, all of them. There are several examples on the use of OpenStreetMap for humanitarian response. In conjunction with other information sources, the OSM layers are used to produce operational maps. Also, there exist OSM and, and other apps for offline navigation based on those maps. OSM is used by surveillance officers as navigation tool, helping find villages that were not available on a printed map. Some of the ambulance and the contamination cars use it to locate the possible affected persons. Before the crisis, the map of Sierra Leone was like this, and now looks like this. Thank you very much. So um, actually you can see that um, in developing countries, uh, it is not like in New York where you use your iPhone and you're going to say where is the closest restaurant or where, where is the closest way to go to from X to Y. Um, the work in the field is quite more challenging yeah? and that's why we rely a lot on OpenStreetMap and often OpenStreetMap is considered as a, one of the best um, information sources to produce our maps and uh, to get some data from there. So, um, the third project is uh, a global initiative called Humanity Data Exchanges, so I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Dita. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to show you the use of OpenStreetMap in a more global uh, from the headquarters uh, 
uses in United Nations. So we use OpenStreetMap at Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is an open data platform. We usually call it HDX. And um, we love humanitarian data, and we want to open, uh, to make humanitarian data accessible, where our users can find good quality data that, we can, that they can use to, for analysis and report. Also, a place where organizations and agencies can easily share their data sets with publics. So, if you go to HDX, uh, here is uh, our front page, and then you can easily browse data by topic, organization, and uh, location. And then we also have specific uh, pages for crisis. This is uh, the example of OpenStreetMap data on HDX. This is the, the location of uh, schools in Kibera in Kenya. And it comes in HDX with uh, full metadata, including the methodology and uh, licenses uh, and the sources. Uh, we also have a special feature for geodata, where uh, data in a specific data format like zip zip file and geojson can be mapped uh, directly on top of OpenStreetMap, so user can see directly on the map, and then it's also interactive. You can hover over uh, the the shape or the point to look at the information directly. Uh, one of the usefulness of OpenStreetMap on HDX was during emergency. For example, the recent uh, Nepal earthquake. Uh, on the day one, we built we built a uh, uh, Nepal earthquake pages that contains uh, a lot of uh, humanitarian data. So the humanitarian uh, em and emergency response team can uh, access uh, data on Nepal earthquake in one place. And then uh, open humanitarian open street map was one of the first who contributed their data in uh, HDX. And, uh, and then after that, there are more uploaded on open street map data, which is uh, uh, very highly usable by our users. Over the course of one week, we have over 200 downloads that is used for human Thank you. Uh, uh, we're going to continue. <laughs> so uh, we have a question actually. Um, so how many of you have heard about the humanity data exchanges? Okay, that's, that's good. Um, so Humanity Data Exchanges um, actually was launched last year, correct? Uh, and um, before what was missing to is was to have a centralized portal where people can download free and open data. So um, we are happy that uh, this initiative has been launched and uh, so we are encouraging people to check and to use it. Uh, and uh, Dita and Luis has a booth outside so you can, uh, um, of course, during lunch or maybe after lunch, <laughs> you can check and uh, um, she can do a demo on how to use open street, um, not open street, map, sorry, humanity data exchanges. So uh, lastly, we want to show you a couple of uh, testimony um, because we really are super fan of OpenStreetMap and uh, you guys really do a great job and it facilitated our work because we don't have capacity, uh, we don't have uh, capacity to do all those mapping and to collect all those data. So um, we are really happy that this initiative happened and every time there is a crisis, uh, Haiti, Nepal, earthquake, things like that, we know that we can uh, rely on open street map, and especially the hot team. So um, this is in French, uh, so let me uh, translate. It was um, a GIS officer based in Chad. So he said that although um, sometimes uh, due to low connectivity, it's sometimes difficult to use uh, OpenStreetMap data, however, they still remain a very good um, information um, and this is again John Marinos, uh, the person uh, who is based in uh, Thailand in our regional office, who said that uh, he wanted to work on data preparedness for Nepal. Actually, he was also um, deployed uh, during the Philippine Typhoon Haiyan. 
and he's saying, my closest interaction with OpenStreetMap came during the high-end response in which the hot team mapped all of Ta Tacloban City in a few days. It was timely, useful, relevant, and simply fantastic. I am a long f uh, uh, lifelong fan of OpenStreetMap after that experience. Um, example where the conflict has been going on for more than four years now. And um, access to the country is very difficult. Um, and of course, some of those countries doesn't have a um, strong national mapping agency capacity. So meaning that we rely a lot on other um, information sources. So our colleague um, based in um, uh, the regional office in Jordan uh, was saying, we rely on open street map data for GIS and mapping for Syria. And they're looking actually for future collaboration. So I can see that hot team are here. <laughs> so if you are interested um, working with us on Syria, uh, they are really looking for um, mapping some of the uh, um, non-accessible area of uh, Syria. So Lebanon uh, is also part of the Syria crisis. Actually, the um, uh, people who are affected in Syria, they have many refugees who are going to the neighboring countries including Turkey, Lebanon, and other neighboring countries. So um, our few colleagues who is based in uh, Lebanon, um, information management officer, uh, he is also looking for future collaboration uh, to work with OpenStreetMap. Um, Mali, so they have excellent, excellent um, collaboration work between inter-agency, inter-cluster, information management and GIS officer, and OpenStreetMap and the Humanitarian Country team in Mali. So almost all the operation apps is using actually OpenStreetMap data. And um, um, I heard only, only good and positive feedback um, about this collaboration. So um, lastly, uh, it is a, um, when I got feedback from all my uh, colleagues in the field office, I only received hands up. Uh, no negative comments. Um, uh, they are also looking for more collaboration, more work with OpenStreetMap. Maybe one single challenge was saying that maybe some country that hasn't good internet connectivity, it is difficult to download some data sets. So uh, they would like to have a wish that probably there will be different ways to download the data so that um, although it's in local, um, they can still download some data set. And also the um, uh, offline version of uh, OpenStreetMap uh, is highly used in the field, especially when they are going to the remote villages. Um, uh, they often use the OpenStreetMap um, uh, offline version. So um, the tagline with uh, OCHA is called um, Coordination Safe Lives. Um, but I just want to change a little bit. And maybe we can say that <laughs> OpenStreetMap saved lives as well. Um, so uh, we really want to say thank you to uh, uh, all your collaborative work. All the volunteers who are working for free to help us to um, uh, respond faster on a timely way uh, to humanitarian response. So a big thank you from you. Have um, any questions? Uh, we are here to respond. And um, um, and a little, one one other thing is. Um, Maybe you are familiar with the OCHA humanitarian icons. Have you heard about the free humanitarian icons? Yes, some of them. Um, so we'd like also to see how uh, we can also contribute to OpenStreetMap uh, because we are also developing uh, free resources like the humanitarian icons. We have also some of the data sets, so we are interested to see also how OCHA can also contribute to make uh, OpenStreetMap a uh, uh, project. Thank you. So um, we have time for uh, questions and answer. Any questions? No. Maybe so. Are we? Are we give you <laughs> tips on some? Some of you might be interested in working for the United Nations in futures. So um, uh, jobs uh, where you can, uh, if you have some students interested, to see where you can find jobs uh, working with us. Uh, there is a, a website called reliefweb.int where there's a job section, and there you can see all the, uh, jobs available working in, not only for the United Nations, uh, it's actually for the, in the humanitarian. So um, we list um, uh, jobs in NGOs, international organizations, as well as um, um, uh, United Nations. 
And um, when you look for job uh, title, um, usually you won't see a cartographer or GIS. Um, usually we are using the term information management officer uh, as a title, so meaning that you can work on data preparedness, you're going to work on uh, GIS, you're going to work on mapping, um, databases, website. Actually, information management officers have to have um, knowledge in um, various ways, and depending on they're going to prioritize different tasks. Um, so if you want, please check reliefweb.int, and you have a, a job. So no question? Ah, yes. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, I'm Patrick from AppGive. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the evolution of uh, use of OSM in the field when that comes to like uh, new technologies or field papers, and how do you see this kind of playing out in the next couple years for the UN system? So. Um we have actually still challenges, although we know that the technical, uh, technically it is available, tools and um, uh, data. Sometimes it's very difficult to make implementation in the field. Um, just to give you an example, um, every time there's a disaster, um, it, people think that as we are the United Nations, we will get all data instantly. It, and it's not the cases. Most of the time when we receive data, it's very, very basic data. So you're going to have uh, to get the number of people affected. Uh, depending on countries, you're going to receive just by email some of the numbers and um, basic spreadsheet. Even sometimes you re we receive basic spreadsheet and you try to look and clean it. Um, the total doesn't match the um, uh, breakdown. So this is the way we still work. And um, so paper map is still uh, highly used in the field, operational map, printed map. We always deploy a plotters to print that. So um, I think uh, there is a little bit gaps, but depending on countries, as you saw, for example, in Indonesia, they are advanced more technically. Um, Philippines as well, uh, they are advanced, so meaning that you can implement uh, new technology and to make the response better. But some of the countries, poor internet connectivity, connectivity uh, lack of tools, so it's going to take much more time in order to have um, um, new technology in implemented. However, uh, the good news is that in Africa, for example, um, they're using a lot of mobile phones. And uh, actually, I think there's much more mobile phones than uh, computers. So meaning that technology involving mobile phones is improving. Uh, so we are hoping that in a couple of years, we have more better data and better uh, technology in place. Thank you. Uh, yes? Okay, sorry. Uh, Benson, also from AppGive, I'm monopolizing our time. Um, I, this is great and really amazing feedback. I'm curious, so you, the great quotes and comments from information managers and GIS officers. I'm curious if you're starting to see, if not traction, then awareness from your leadership or folks higher in the ranks. Uh, and if you're sending these videos around um, within OCHUR, within the broader UN system, because I think they're I know they'd be very useful for some of our leadership at state and USAID to see. So the question is uh, to see if the senior management um, uh, are aware of all those projects and initiatives, um, correct? Yeah. So um, actually the senior management, they are using uh, the maps in order to make decisions. So every time there is a disaster, um, uh, the first one of the first thing they're going to ask is, where is the map? And you saw that in even high-level conferences, um, uh, security counseling and things like that, they're going to ask for maps. So it will be uh, one of the most important uh, products and tools that they're looking for um, after the disaster. Um, so yes, definitely, um, the senior management are aware. And um, uh, however, we still need to, I believe, educate senior management um, to teach them um, how it functions or how to we, we're going to we, we get there 
because uh, many people is going to think that producing a map is very easy, getting a map uh, data is very easy, and they're going to question why I don't have yet the uh, maps showing the uh, location where we need to uh, respond. Um, one of the challenges we're facing is uh, what we call the 3W, who does what where. So when there is a disaster strike, you have so many people uh, who is going to deploy in the, uh, in the field to support the disasters. And of course, in order to be coordinated, we need to know who is doing what and where. And those data is very challenging, but the senior management is looking for from day one or day two to have this type of information. So it is our role to, in order to educate and to, to say how challenging it is to get the data, how much time it takes to, to produce map, um, and also, of course, um, we have to also uh, educate about the challenge we could be facing. Does it answer to your question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what I was getting at, the process of the data collection. And I know HGX is having, you know, similar challenges where you see the visualization, you understand the power of that, but understanding the process behind it is still, I think, what we're all trying to educate. Exactly. Yes? Follow-up question. Uh, in terms of the leadership, most of the maps that we send around in the humanitarian community tend to be static maps, PDFs, paper maps. Have you been experimenting with giving the leadership something that's actually far more dynamic and getting them a web map or even going so far as to actually hand them a tablet? Yes, so this is a very good question. And um, actually, I'm, I've been advocating for years about um, moving toward from PDF maps to interactive one. We pilot, uh, piloted actually a couple of um, interactive mapping. Um, so if you go to Relief Web, um, uh, we piloted two maps, one uh, on um, uh, DRC, uh, DR Congo. Actually, we, it, it was Mapbox team, actually, who developed for us uh, at that time. So it was a map showing the number of displacement and refugees uh, in DRC. And you will be able to scroll down to see the evolution. And every time you click on the, uh, one of the um, um, data, you will be able to see the numbers and also be able to download it. Um, the second um, uh, project was on Philippines uh, after uh, Typhoon Haiyan, exactly the same way we wanted to uh, visualize in a way so that people can see the trends, uh, how the evolutions as well as uh, getting and downloading the data. So we piloted, but we are really far from what we can do. Uh, we need to be better at that. And uh, actually, AGX is also working uh, um, on interactive mapping. Maybe, Dita, you'd like to explain a little bit more? Yeah, uh, also with the uh, available uh, data on HDX, which is not PDF, everything tabular in CSV and geodata, uh, we want to make sure that it's easy to use that data to make more interactive. Then people can uh, uh, use our API uh, and then uh, for web developer to make visualization based on data on HDX. We have a couple of uh, 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 example of data visualization. For example, in the WFP, they make a visualization or market price, but uh, still also challenges that uh, well, I think there are more uh, opportunity to use humanitarian data in more interactive way. Um, so we are doing still some piloting. Um, so we are using D3. Uh, we are using um, um, uh, Mapbox and um, um, some of your colleagues as well. They are trying with the RGS. Um, so um, meaning that we still haven't reached a point where we can recommend uh, to our field officer, for example, what type of tools we need to use or what type of interactive mapping we, ha we have to do. But this is definitely the direction we like to go. And especially having a mobile vo version would be excellent by knowing that this is the tools that um, uh, people in the field are using. But I just want to say another thing. Although interactive is the direction we like to go, uh, we're still relying a lot on PDF. Um, printed map is going to be still there in, um, in the field for operation purpose. So um, I think we, we need to walk towards the two tracks. Any other questions? Okay. So thank you very much and thank you for um, OpenStreetMap and uh, uh, we are a huge fun. <laughs>